Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and we're back with another of our 5-Minute Histories videos, and today we're going to talk about the Steve Silver Building that's behind me. But I'm going to start out with a humble suggestion. If you're like me, you're going to spend Thanksgiving, and we're just a few days before Thanksgiving, um, in probably a way that you would never have imagined a year ago. Um, uh, and my suggestion is uh, to sparkle it up a little bit, uh, especially because we're going to talk about silver um, in these kind of dark COVID days. Sparkle it up by bringing out your silver polishing it up and using it. Um, so whether your Thanksgiving dinner table is just you or a few people, or even if you don't celebrate Thanksgiving at all, um, give it a try. I'll bet that it brings a smile to your face, maybe because it's so sparkly, um, or maybe because it brings back a fond memory, or maybe because it's a little bit ridiculous to be sitting there at a pretty empty table uh, that looks like something out of Downton Abbey. But uh, give it a shot. All right, we're at Steve Silver. It was founded in 1892 by George Clinton Steve and his partners, but we're going to start our story a little bit before that. We're going to, uh, don't worry though, we're not going to go back to the millennia before Christ in the Near East where silversmiths first got their start. We're going to go back to 1815 with a gentleman, another silversmith, a gentleman named Samuel Kirk. Um, Kirk came from a long line of silversmiths in London, where his family's from, um, did his apprenticeship in Philadelphia, and then opened a shop here in Baltimore. In 1815. He started out uh, uh, producing things with pretty clean lines. They were pretty simple. That was all the rage in Georgian London at the time and, and here in the United States and I guess the late federal period. Um, but he anticipated that people were going to get sick of what was called elegant simplicity and want something with more ornamentation. And so he revived an older European technique called repose. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, but it's pretty neat. And here's how, here's how you do it. You take uh, an item, let's say a bowl, you make a silver bowl without any ornamentation, and you draw whatever it is you want to go on the outside. You draw it on the inside of the bowl, like a rose or a flower or a scroll. And then you take this gadget called a snarling iron. And if that is not the greatest name of a device you've ever heard, I do not know what it is. The snarling iron is a bent piece of metal, and you stick one end into a vise, and on the other, it's got a little metal ball, kind of like the end of a ball peen hammer, if you know what that is. And then you give your snarling iron a whack with a hammer and it vibrates. And as if it's vibrating, you take your bowl and you move it around so that little ball on the end uh, moves around and follows the pattern that you've drawn on the inside. And on the outside of the bowl, that creates little bumps. And I think it's called bumping out. And once you're done bumping out your pattern, you fill your bowl with pitch, which is kind of like a gooey tar substance. And that gives uh, the, the thin silver a little more heft. And then after years of apprenticeship and practice, um, you work with a variety of chisels and hammers and you turn those little bumps into your rose or your scroll or whatever it is and you come out if you're good with a fantastic uh, silver bowl that's got a lot of ornamentation on it. So Kirk really uh, embraces this. He's one of the first to do so in the United States and probably the most prolific early silversmith to do so. And, uh, and uh, he produces all sorts of things. A little later, he gets fascinated by some of the archaeology finds at Herculaneum and Pompeii that were happening at the time. Um, so he harkens back to ancient Rome and Greece and produces these massive punch bowls and things with a lot of ornamentation. And then after the Civil War in the 1860s and 70s, he gets fascinated by uh, sort of the Renaissance exuberance and produces items uh, that have, uh, for example, centerpiece, table centerpieces that are sort of over the top crazy. There is so much ornamentation going on, you hardly even know where to start. Um, uh, and he's doing really well, but we're going to talk about Steve. Let's go back to Steve. 1892, he and his colleagues uh, buy a company, the Florence Silver Company. A year later, they rename it uh, the Baltimore Sterling Silver Manufacturing Company. Uh, I think a better name for us Baltimore. Um, uh, and then in 1904, he buys out his partners and the company becomes the Steve Company. And he does really well. He's, uh, he's doing very, very well. Uh, in 1914, he hands the reins over to his son Gideon. Um, and uh, he actually dies in 1923. He dies at his desk uh, at the manufacturing plant. Um, at that time, uh, Steve was downtown. They bopped around a little bit on Cider Alley and then German Street, which we now know as Redwood Street. Um, uh, uh, they have a showroom on Liberty Street. Uh, some of you may have parents uh, or grandparents that visited that. It was there for a long time. Um, so a year after dad dies, Gideon buys this property behind me and uh, uh, builds a one-story manufacturing plant, uh, state-of-the-art. And then in 1929, things are going so well, he adds a second story onto it, 
just in time for the stock market crash and the Great Depression. But to Gideon's credit, he never lays anybody off, even in the leanest years, even if it means giving a master silversmith a paintbrush and putting them to work painting the walls of the, uh, the factory. Um, so after the war, uh, after World War II, um, uh, uh, Steve uh, looks around the country and sees a lot of people moving to the suburbs and suburban shopping malls popping up. Um, and so they uh, get their goods, their product, into hundreds of stores and malls across the country. Um, uh, and so we now have tens of thousands of people who are proud owners of Steve's silver products. Um, they come in wonderful lines, hearkening back to Baltimore, some of them. Um, the Homewood line, the Homewood pattern. Homewood House, if you know that. The Betsy Patterson pattern, if you know the uh, Baltimore Bride of Napoleon's brother. Um, they make specialty items for places like Colonial Williamsburg. So there's a Williamsburg pattern and the Smithsonian. There's a Smithsonian pattern. Um, and things are going really well. And they also produce every couple years a, an enormous catalog. Um, some of you may actually still have that if you rummage through your bookshelf uh, with upwards of a thousand Steve items that you could purchase either in one of those stores um, or uh, direct by phone. You could call in your uh, call in your order that way as well. Um, in 1967, Steve purchases another company, the Showfield Silver Company. They're probably best known for making the wood lawn vase that's uh, handed out as the prize at the Preakness each year. Um, so Steve's now in charge of that. Um, and in the 1970s, they merge with Kirk and Son Silversmith, their crosstown rival. As part of that merger, they agree to put Kirk's name first. So now it's the Kirk Steve Silver Company. Um, and things go well for a little while, uh, uh, but not too long. And uh, about 10 years later, the Steve family sells the company to the Lennox Company, that national giant um, silverware manufacturer. They soon consolidate their manufacturing plants in uh, Rhode Island and in New Jersey. Um, and all of the manufacturing is, uh, is, is out of here by 1999. Um, but we're going to end on a good note. Uh, it didn't take too long before the redevelopment firm of Struver Brothers Eccleson Rouse takes on this building and it's now offices. There's an architecture firm here, GWWO, as well as the Boy Scout shop uh, if you need a patch for your Boy Scout. Um, and mostly for Hopkins University, uh, they have offices here. They're just around the corner. So I'm going to end, though, back to our silver uh, challenge, if you will. And I am, uh, uh, unfortunately, don't have any Steve silver or Kirk silver, but I do have a silver set that my mother gave me, and I'm going to polish it up. We've got, not, and it's got an enormous number of, uh, of things in it, not each place setting, not one but two forks, not one but two spoons, and not just, uh, not just one knife. But we got a second knife, this little guy, and I'm pretty sure that's just for butter. So I am not sure what we are going to eat uh, for Thanksgiving. Uh, but even if it's just macaroni and cheese, we are going to have a sparkling uh, dinner table to serve it on. All right. I hope you have a good one. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time.